I guess one of the questions I always wonder about is how we as individuals and an organisation can enhance the psychological well-being of the patients and families that we meet on a daily basis. So the purpose of today, as Karen mentioned, is really to give an overview of the fellowship. Um, specifically, my interest was around the cognitive behavioural therapy and how that can be adapted to palliative care. And also included in that um, is a training program that exists in the UK where they train multidisciplinary staff in CPT first aid skills training. So it's distinct to, I suppose, some individuals who would use cognitive behavioural therapy um, on a one-to-one -one counselling, say, hour sessions. The concept of this programme was really about, you know, when you're in a moment with a patient or a family member, that there may be skills within CPT that you'll be able to utilise in that particular moment, be it for the two minutes you have, five minutes or ten minutes. Um, and I'll, I'll hopefully give you a bit of an idea uh, around the concepts within CPT that they um, have looked at, some of the research behind it, and, and see, I suppose, maybe is there a way forward, be it within our own organisation, if, if the interest was there about how to proceed with this. So firstly, um, I've mentioned, and Carrie has mentioned, that um, I specifically went to St Christopher's Hospice, um, I made contact initially with Dr. Catherine Mannix, who is based in Newcastle on Tyne. She's a consultant in palliative medicine and a current behavior therapist. And she's been quite involved over the last number of years in coordinating and putting a planning program in place around the training. And she has was signposted me to the training course that was happening in St. Christopher's. Um, and as I mentioned, these are the things that we'll look at today. The fellowship itself as this really has allowed um, a financial bursary to enable this to happen. And I suppose the key thing of doing any kind of training or any kind of learning, I suppose, and what I found from it is making a connection with someone else in another service who has a strong interest in this particular area. And I suppose developing that relationship so that it's not just a one-off kind of conference or a one-off visit, that resources and I suppose the um, experience that both may share is integrated and continues to happen. <coughs> and, and since I visit, enjoying my two visits, um, Kathy Burry, who's a facilitator, and I have, have kind of had that email relationship, if you like, where we've passed on resources. And, and I suppose we would see that that would continue to happen as well. The objectives of the fellowship were to really share innovative methods and mixed methods approaches. Um, so to look at kind of some of the audio um, and video footage that was maybe more available in the UK within internal training programs and how we could get access to that. To develop my own skills and capacity as an educator by observing Cathy in her facilitation of the program. So the program was three days. It was two days in June and one day in September. And the idea was that participants um, attended the first two days, gained skills and insight into how they might include that in their practice and then there was a two month break, so the third day when they came back, they were able to share how they might have integrated that into their practice and challenges that may have arose for them in their practice. Um, to gain knowledge about, they have a cognitive behavioural therapy clinic operating at St Christopher's, um, but I'll mention a little later. And I also got the opportunity to meet with Sterling Morey, who was very involved with Dr Mannix in the initial setup of the programme and also um, provides the training with Cathy Byrne around CBT. So the background to CBT within the part of care setting um, and where it's come from, I suppose some of you will have heard of CBT and know of CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, and its origins mainly would, would have been derived just within the mental health field. So there'd be quite a strong evidence base for it as a treatment of choice for anxiety and depression. Um, and then the interest developed in how might CBT principles be adapted to palliative care, taking into account, I suppose, the physical illness trajectory and have fatigue, pain management and all the other factors that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis could allow for some of these principles to be included. And particularly around, um, I suppose, Maury would have highlighted in 2013 that it's an effective intervention for managing anxiety, depression and distressing symptoms such as pain, nausea and insomnia in cancer patients. Um, the other strand of it is that in, in doing their training, which was predominantly nursing, CNSs and nursing staff that were in, in the training programs, 
that staff um, and feedback was that they were able to use in their practice the first aid skills in improving emotional distress, enhanced coping with physical symptoms, changes in body image, physical ability, and reduced dysfunctional coping strategies. Um, there was a period where training and ongoing supervision was provided for the staff who, who were working on these principles. The other finding from court was that it reduced the job related stress and improved, I suppose, particularly nursing staff's um, experience and confidence in, you know, when they met someone who may have spoken about being breathless, for example, they had a strategy that they could really sit and meet with the person and get an understanding of what the person was thinking and what was contributing to their fear around breathlessness and talk it through rather than have their own assumptions about what might need to happen differently. So it could be said the same for someone maybe who isn't medication compliant. We, we may have views you know, at times that, well, if they take their medication consistently, that will um, alleviate, I suppose, a pain crisis, for example. Um, but, but that message doesn't always, I suppose, sit so well with patients themselves. So really trying to get an understanding of what their perspective and view is on maybe why they're not taking medication is much more valuable in the long term about I suppose, changing their maybe practice. And ultimately they come into that consideration and solution um, and decision themselves rather than us as maybe staff just maybe suggesting our own view and that advice giving. In terms of the three-day program that I attended, um, there was a broad range of the multidisciplinary team. Again, um, a high level um, of, of number of nursing staff working part of care with a home care inpatient. Um, a large number of doctors as well, um, both consultants and, and registrars. Then there was um, social work, physio, occupational therapy, pastoral care chaplain. So quite, quite, quite a range. Um, and I think two or three were also working on a phone line service actually as well. Um, a specific service and they were wondering how they could maybe incorporate these principles um, while working on the, on the phone service. For those of you new to cognitive behavioural therapy, this is just really, I suppose, <coughs> a, a brief outline of all of this. So the idea is that what, what you think and do affects how you feel. Um, this diagram underneath, I suppose, highlights what, we, what is described as a hot cross bun. So it's a way to help formulate um, an understanding of CBT. So on one hand, there are a lot of screening tools and measures such as the hospital and anxiety questionnaire, for example, which might elicit that someone is very anxious per se if they score high in it. But what this aims to do is really, in any one situation, pick something very, very specific. Again, it could be about the breathlessness, it could be about the medication, and really tap into what are the thoughts the person is having around it. You know, what are the physical sensations, and particularly in our area of work, the physical sensations are quite significant. What, what are their emotions attached to it, and, and what are the behaviours? <coughs> so if you had someone, um, for example, who was quite breathless um, and um, had a perception that um, breathlessness, if, if I don't breathe properly, I could die, just for example, the behaviours you might find is that they will... Um, sit still, they stay in one place, they might refuse visitors, refuse to move from A to B for fear that <coughs> breath or using too much breath could contribute to this idea that they would die. The emotions could be linked to possibly um, fearfulness, um, worry, you know, low mood, um, and, and bodily sensations, I suppose, that experience of, you know, um, when they're even breathing, kind of monitoring their breathing and, and as a result maybe hyperventilating. Um, so getting a better understanding of, of a specific, specific scenario can really help, I suppose, the person in, 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 in discussion maybe come to their own idea and understanding of what might be better. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the context of these key skills. So within the program, um, the, the cognitive model is just what I've discussed, um, and it was, I suppose, a lot of the examples used were particular to palliative care setting. The Socratic questioning is um, a term you may have heard of, originates from Socrates, and Christine Podesky is um, one of the authors who's written quite a bit about it within the CBT. Um, the idea, again, is that we don't form our own assumptions as many professionals working with someone, that we, in our questions, um, create this kind of curiosity, this naiveness. So tell me a little bit more about it. 
um, what do you make of all of that? And the, the big challenge is that we don't jump in and answer something for the person or give a prescriptive idea of you should do this. And that, that actually can be quite a challenge for some disciplines if a lot of their training has been quite factual and that you're meant to know the answer to things. And if someone asks you something, um, not falling into that role of, of advice given freely. The other section that the model would look at um, is challenging negative thoughts. And there are eight or nine particular negative thoughts that, that we can understand um, ex that exist. Introduction to behavioural techniques and managing solvable and unsolvable worry. So considerations within the part of care setting. Um, I suppose that idea that managing solvable and unsolvable worries. Um, there are aspects of people's thought processes that are very real for them, that it's not imagined. And, and that things can be very difficult. Um, and I suppose the ultimate fear um, and anxiety is the fear of dying. And I guess sometimes we, we can't necessarily solve that or change that pathway, but what we can maybe consider is, well, what is contributing to that fear? And is that an accurate representation as to what could happen? And finding out a bit more about that. But in palliative care, we know that things can be that bad for people, and we have to appreciate and understand that. Um, in terms of, I've just mentioned about the Socratic questioning, that was one of the really strong themes that came across on day three of the programme, um, that um, when, when you may have five minutes, if you like, in a situation to discuss or explore something with a patient, and it was particularly from a medical and nursing perspective that it was, was coming from, the challenge of, um, at a medical level, being asked to answer something and not give an answer was really quite difficult. Um, and it really challenged people in changing their style of communicating in some ways, in particular scenarios. Um, and that, that's something I suppose that's just, you know, a demand and a change and a different way of working that we'd all find challenging. Devising appropriate activities and experiments, part of the, the skills <coughs> module would relate to, um, so say if someone is breathless and they're sitting and they're not moving and they're confined to their corner and they don't want to go anywhere, um, one of your, your behavioural tasks might be to include family and work on maybe them going, say an example here, going from their bed down to the chapel or going from here down to the dining room, just to see if what they think is going to happen will really happen. But with fatigue and pain um, combined into that equation for a lot of our patients, it, it's difficult sometimes to, I suppose, find the appropriate behavioural task that will deal with the situation at hand. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, I suppose it's about flexibility and adaptation of the CBT model. So again, it, the idea and concept was that within palliative care, you know, people may be you know, somewhat exhausted by the medical professions and the hospitals that they, and all the appointments that they have, that if it's a case that they um, require psychological intervention, introducing someone from an external service or expecting the person to go for a one hour session isn't actually going to be maybe realistic. And also financial constraints play a role as well. So, and then as with a person's you know, illness trajectory is also another factor. So the idea that skills might be utilized within the service that they're in, in that moment that would, I suppose, maybe increase their capacity to cope in that given situation. And again, going back to that, that the nursing staff found increase their confidence and skills in, in managing situations and supporting a patient. Um, I guess time and energy constraints are always a factor. And this came up again on day three, you know, um, particularly as a nursing, um, profession, you know, if you're there um, and, and your priority is around maybe the physical care of the patient and that has to be kind of primary, having time to maybe sit and talk through a scenario if you have a number of other patients to see and you're always juggling that balance. And just overall, I suppose I'd really just like to thank um, Karen and Michael and Gareth um, in, in the other end institute. I know to, to Mary, Ita and Sean and colleagues here um, for supporting the release to attend and to Kathy Warren, Sterling, and Dr. Catherine Mannix in Newcastle at one time. They, they really were quite fantastic and really invested and interested in the idea that others outside of the UK base, if you like, would have an interest in developing um, CBT skills training. Um, 
and even you know in the context of the CBT clinic in particular, you know, we'll give some guidance around that. Um, that clinic at the moment operates particularly for patients and not carers or family members, which is I suppose the work that we in social work kind of balance doing, if you like. So it, it was a great opportunity to just um, share ideas really and get some guidance and it's also influenced some of the work we were doing here. We had the um, coping with life permitting illness seminars that we had set up earlier in the year and I know Cathy now is in the process of developing something similar so we've been able to share ideas and resources um, I suppose to improve our capacity in delivering um, an intervention to, to patients and families. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.